Canada is a large country that just like its southern neighbors stretches from the Pacific to the Atlantic, yet compared to the United States has fewer subdivisions. While the United States has 50 states, Canada only has 10 provinces and 3 territories. But despite there being less geographical division in Canada, there are still some provinces that have strong local identities to the point where you could almost imagine that they could be their own country, similar to the joke of Texan independence. Notably, Quebec has had actual attempts at secession due to its origins as a French colony that got taken over by the British, resulting in a very prideful francophone culture. Then there are various ideas, both joking and serious, about Alberta or the Prairie Provinces potentially being their own country. However, unlike those examples, there is one Canadian province that can actually claim that they were once their own country, and that province is Newfoundland and Labrador. At first, this is understandably a bit surprising, because Newfoundland and Labrador is the second least populated province behind only tiny Prince Edward Island. It also doesn't assert itself as strongly compared to its next door neighbor Quebec, but Newfoundland's short time as its own independent country is better understood once you look at its history. While Newfoundland Island would briefly be competed over by the British and French, ultimately the British Newfoundland colony founded in 1610 would succeed in controlling the entire island. For the most part, it was basically a fishing-based economy, and it didn't feel as connected to the other British colonies in the mainland. However, in 1809, Newfoundland would be given control of a part of mainland Canada in the form of Labrador. Originally, Labrador was a part of Quebec, but it was sparsely populated outside of fishermen along the coast, most of which came from Newfoundland, so the British government thought it made sense to attach it to the Newfoundland colony. Quebec would dispute the border of Labrador, believing that the interior parts were rightfully theirs. So when did Newfoundland go from colony to independent country? Well, that actually kind of depends on how you look at it. For a few special British colonies, independence wasn't sudden, but rather gradual, through a complicated, multi-step bureaucratic process. This wasn't necessarily a system the British intended to happen, so much as something that happened over time. Ruling 25% of the world can be difficult, so if you can find ways to let some colonies run their own affairs, it'll make things a lot easier. But of course, eventually even those colonies would want more independence, and the British Empire would find new ways to give them more independence, but somehow keep them technically within the British Empire. We're going to go down the road on the step-by-step -step process that Newfoundland had on achieving independence, like other special colonies. The first step is responsible government. Basically, a responsible government is when a British colony was granted its own form of parliament. While it wasn't independent or sovereign in the slightest, at the very least they could appoint representatives for themselves to run the colony. For Newfoundland, they were given responsible government in 1855. The other Canadian colonies had been given responsible government across the past decade or so, and this led to talks about them possibly uniting into a single mega-colony of sorts. Newfoundland was offered to join, but they rejected this, worried about being overshadowed by the much more influential colonies of Upper and Lower Canada, Upper and Lower Canada, along with New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, would unite to form the Confederation of Canada. Prince Edward Island originally rejected offers to join, but would end up joining the new Confederation of Canada in 1873, leaving Newfoundland all by itself. The next step in the process was becoming a Dominion. The word Dominion has evolved in meaning over the centuries within the British Empire, but by the beginning of the 20th century, a Dominion was a colony that not only had its own parliament, but autonomy. Now they could regulate more local laws themselves all on their own. They could even now elect a prime minister to go along with their parliament instead of relying on the colonial governor. They still couldn't change their government rules without approval of the British government, and the British monarch would still be their head of state, but now they could enjoy these new special privileges. Newfoundland became a dominion in 1907, joining a group that now included Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Technically under this step, they weren't colonies anymore but they weren't quite independent either. But all this would change with the 1931 Statute of Westminster. The 1931 Statute of Westminster was a document that made Dominions mostly independent. From this point forward, no law passed by the UK Parliament would affect a Dominion. Dominions could now adopt their own flags, their own armed forces and regulations for those, have their own set of diplomats, and they could even join the League of Nations as their own country but they still couldn't edit their government structure without British approval, and the monarch was still the head of state. So they're considered to be both their own country and yet still within the British Empire. 
I would make a comparison to, like, someone being an adult allowed to do what they please, but they still have to follow their parents' rules as long as they live under their roof. So basically, with this act, Newfoundland was now its own country. Sort of. While the Statute of Westminster automatically applied to Canada, for Newfoundland the statute was offered to them. This meant that while Britain is perfectly fine with Newfoundland adopting the statute, they required that Newfoundland would have to approve of the statute itself. Newfoundland was also given the option to selectively adopt individual sections of the statute, and adopt it at their own pace. Newfoundland ended up adopting some, but not all, of the statute. Does this mean that they still counted as a non-sovereign, but independent country? It's complicated, and you could honestly argue either way. However, Newfoundland's independent status would end thanks to the Great Depression. As mentioned earlier, Newfoundland's economy was primarily fishing, and by this point also a bit of mining. However, the Great Depression hit Newfoundland extra hard. Things got so bad that on April 5th, 1932, a mob of 10,000 people drove the Newfoundland Prime Minister out of his office. This chaos led to the British intervening at their request, and in 1934, after an investigation, the British decided that Newfoundland could no longer responsibly govern itself. While it would be referred to as a dominion in name, it was now effectively all the way back to being a normal colony, and not even with responsible government. So, depending on who you ask, independent Newfoundland lasted either 27 years or 3 years. After World War II, there was a debate on whether Newfoundland should try independence again or join Canada. So, on June 3, 1948, Newfoundland held a referendum. Voters could decide on whether to remain a British colony, become a dominion again with responsible government, or enter Canada as a province. None of the choices got 50%, but remaining a colony was clearly the loser option, so they held a second round between Dominion and joining Canada, which resulted in a slim majority supporting joining Canada. Newfoundland would join Canada on March 31st, 1949 as an official province. It's been a part of Canada ever since, and it changed its name to Newfoundland and Labrador in 2001. So sure, Newfoundland is now a part of Canada, but how does the rest of that independent process work out? Well, the final step of independence from the British Empire is patriation, which Canada did in 1982. With patriation, Canada doesn't need British approval for any amendment to its laws or constitution at all. So by every definition, Canada is now totally sovereign and independent. Maybe you could argue that a further step would be becoming a republic, since the British monarch is still head of state, but their role is so small and symbolic that it's not really that materially different. While there are very small secessionist movements in Newfoundland and Labrador, it's nowhere close to others like Quebec's, so I don't see them ever leaving Canada anytime soon. I found their brief independence interesting, and I hope you did too. I'm Emperor Tigerstar, and I'll see you guys next time.